glory, glory, glory. All right, how you guys? Uh, you got your stuff? You ready? You ready? We, you know where we are, right? Uh, we've been in uh, a study of the life of David. Not, not all the life of David, but just the little section that deals with uh, his preparation and moving to the battle with Goliath, which is probably one of the most famous fights that has ever been with uh, David being the classic underdog and Goliath being the big old champion. And, um, and we've been taught all our life. How many of you have uh, been in church for a good portion of your life? Let me just see your hand. Just kind of see where we are. All right. How many of you have heard the story of David and Goliath from pretty much nursery time on up? You know, Bible school, vacation Bible school. Uh, yeah. So, okay. You guys got it. Well, you know the story and you know how often it's told and how we study it and we look at it, and especially as children and as we grow up and we develop images in our mind when we hear certain stories and certain things being talked about. You know, we just kind of go back, and, and I was thinking about this when I was preparing all of these messages uh, that we've been in for the last three weeks. And, and, and I, I, you know, as I read through 1 Samuel 16 and 17, the story is very familiar. We, we know the story. Many of us know the story, and we know what happened and how it happened and, uh, and all of the, the events of, of what's going on. And, and I began to picture in my mind, as I was just reading it myself for probably a hundred times or so, and, uh, and, I, and I found myself thinking just like uh, I had pretty much always thought about it. You know, you just kind of put your, a lot of times when, you've read, when you're reading things that are, you're very familiar with, you just kind of put your brain in neutral and you just kind of, you know, read through and, and it, your brain just follows the paths that it's always followed through. And uh, as I did that, I believe I felt challenged by the Spirit of God. I believe this is one of the ways God speaks to you. Uh, obviously by his word, and when you read his word, if there's something there that he wants to speak to you about, many times as you read familiar things, he begins to awaken in you something that hasn't been there before. You see things in a different way. I mean, I'm sure you've experienced this, right? You've been reading a passage or Maybe the preacher said, turn to you know, uh, a passage, and you open your Bible, and you, you see, man, I, this is so, I've read this a thousand times. But as a message comes from it, you know, the, it, it's different, and it changes you, and your perception is different, and how it speaks to you is different. And I believe that's one of the ways God speaks to our heart. You know, we, we always talk about it, and you hear people testify all the time, well, the Lord spoke to me. And I know that, it, you know, if you're a novice in church or if you haven't really been very much with the Lord, you, you're wondering, how does that happen? <laughs> does he just talk like a voice? I mean, did you hear a voice or was it like a bird that flew in your window and said, this is God, you know, or thunder, lightning? I mean, was it like that Cecil B. DeMille, you know, the Ten Commandments movie <laughs> that we've all seen so many hundreds of times? Was it like that kind of stuff, you know, thunder and lightning and no, it, it usually is something very simple that God uses to speak to us. Uh, a word in a praise song, uh, a line, a melody, a, 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 a passage of scripture, uh, something inside when you pray and, and you just sense something unique about that and you begin to roll things over in your mind and it begins to take you places where you haven't been before and thoughts that you haven't had before and sometimes it's a word from another Christian or maybe a part of a message that challenges you and you go, man, never thought about that. How have I read that and never thought about that? Well, this is, this is what has been happening with, to me uh, with David and Goliath here. And, and I, uh, I have been really shocked to find how much the Lord has spoken to me about something other than the reality of David standing in, with a sling and slaying Goliath, the giant. Uh, God has really opened up some, I think, some truth to me that is very helpful for me and I hope helpful for you and I hope the Lord's been speaking to you in the past three messages. This is the fourth message. We have one more, by the way, if you're wondering where we are in this. Just the, the 16th and 17th chapter of 1 uh, of Samuel. And, um, but the three previous messages, we, I, the series I've called The Edge, uh, believing that God does give us an edge. As believers, as children of His, God 
um, does things in us, to us, through us, for us, by us, with us, that, um, that need to be accomplished in this world. God has a, an assignment for us, if you will. A purpose uh, is another way to put it. Uh, a destiny might be what some say. Not in, not in terms of it's going to happen regardless of what I do, but a destiny in terms of I have a destination that, I'm, that, I'm, that God's sending me to. That my life does have a destination that it's going, and God has something to do through me and with me and to me and for me and along with me. And, and so God's given us an edge. I mean, if he, if, he, if he calls us to these assignments, then certainly he's going to equip us and enable us and empower us to do that which is necessary to accomplish the assignment. And, and David and, and David is a wonderful example of this uh, because he is anointed as a young boy, you remember, and I won't go back through all of that, but, but he's anointed, and, and, and so God anoints us. David was anointed with a horn of oil. We're anointed by God himself, the Holy Spirit coming and living on the inside of us. And he brings with him giftings and anointings and powers and enablements and, and, and all of these wonderful things that come, come with him to be a part of our life. It's what the scripture teaches us. And, and so we're anointed, but the gifts that we have, we learned in the second message that the gifts that we have and the abilities that we have and the things that God brings with him need to have a little tag on the side of them that might say some assembly required. Because these giftings and these talents and these anointings and these abilities are not just automatic. They have to be grown. We have to grow these things. We have to cooperate with God. We have to place ourselves under his, uh, his mentorship you know, and his tutelage. And, 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 and he grows us and he develops us and he, and he teaches us and he, he, he builds us and he matures us. And, and we become usable with all of these things that God has placed on the inside of us. But it all really depends a lot on our attitude about what God is doing in our life. And the third message was like David, you know, who came to the battlefield and saw the giant insult the armies of God and God himself and said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And he would defy the armies of God. That's passion. You know, all the rest of the people heard the same thing David heard. They had heard it for 39 days in a row. This was the 40th day. None of them got upset. None of them challenged it. It didn't bother them. But David hears it one time, and boom, man, David said, who does this guy think he is? So it takes a passion, a, a, an attitude of passion, because passion really is the, the fuel that powers the engine of accomplishment. Lots of things never get done because there's just no drive to do it. And along comes a passionate person, and, and things get done. Things happen. The, the purpose goes forward. So David's taught us all of those things, and we've seen those things so far. And you'll remember from last week on the day when David confronts or encounters Goliath that David does not go into the day thinking, you know, today's going to be a great day in my life. I believe God's going to give me something today that I've never had before. And, you know, if I run into a giant, let's just say out there, uh, I think I'll just take him on. That's what I'm, so I'm, David doesn't start the day thinking any of that. David starts the day with a simple assignment from dad. Go out and take the, this bread and this cheese to your brothers up on the battlefield. That's the simple assignment that David has. And not thinking that there will be anything different or special about today. I think that's one reason why it's wise to come to church. I say this to people all the time, and I know it sounds a little, maybe a little simplistic about life, but I have found this to be true. I've been with the Lord, gosh, how long? Since I was uh, 16 years old, I'm 63, so somebody do the math on that real quick. 45, 30, some years, a lot of years. Been with the Lord a long time. And the thing that I've learned about the Lord is that if I, will, if I will put myself in a place to hear him, he will speak to me. Now, I know you can hear God anywhere. I know you can hear him on the golf course, on the, at the fishing hole, out on the deer stand. I mean, I know you can hear God in lots of places, but the most likely place for you to hear God 
is where God's people are, where God has someone that he has called and anointed to stand up and and speak the word that is sent from him that week to the people of God so they can hear it and their lives can be prepared for what happens that week. And so I tell people, really, hey, look, I'm going to tell you how you, you, you want to know how to have a good life? You want to know how to, you want to know how to walk with God and how to, how to grow and, and, and be successful in, in the Christian realm of life and, and love God and be passionate? You want to know how to do that? It's really simple. All you have to do, just come to church. Yeah, don't miss. When the doors are open, be in there. Listening, asking God, speak to me. I'm I'm listening, Lord. Because, look, even though you don't know what's going to happen this week, I'll tell you who does. God knows. And God will prepare you for what's going to happen this week if you'll give him an opportunity to speak to your heart about it. And so it's wise, I think, to be here and to hear what God says so that God can put something in you that'll prepare you for what you're going to face this week. Man, there are a lot of giants out there. I don't know if you know this or not. There are a lot of enemies out there of the cross and the kingdom, and God will prepare us if we'll just you know, give him a chance to prepare us and speak to our heart. Now, last week, let's just, just going to read through the scriptures, and then we're going to come to where we are now. Starting in verse 17, this is what happened. Then Jesse said to his son David, uh, Take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers. Uh, they're on the battlefield. Take along these, cheese, these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. Uh, they are with Saul and all of the men of Israel in the Valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, so excited, David <laughs> David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up a set up, and set out. And Je- as Jesse had directed, he reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Uh, I, I mentioned something about that last week. That 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 had to be, I mean, I don't, that, that had to be uh, insulting to God, in in, in my opinion, uh, for forty days. Forty days they they've been pretending to be somebody. I mean, forty days they've been imitating a real army of God. You know, they're 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 shouting and running out to the battle line only to get there and not fight the enemy only to get there and be insulted and intimidated by the enemy and turn tail and run. But there they are. And so they, Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. And David left his things with the keeper of the supplies and he ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they are. (laughs) How are you guys? Man, what is going on down there? (laughs) A lot more interested in what was happening, I'm sure, out there on the battle line than he was up there. But his dad said, hey, go find out how your brothers are. So he had to at least check on them, you know, and say, hey, how you guys doing? So that he could tell dad that he really did ask them how they were doing. And as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. And whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Now, the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man comes, keeps, uh, this man keeps coming out? He, he comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. Great incentive here. David asked the man, the man standing near him, uh, what will be done for the man who kills the Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? I bet you can't work that into a sentence this week in the conversation. (laughs) Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defy the armies of God? So he's he's, he's still shook up about what he's heard Goliath said. They repeated to him what they had been saying, and they told him this is what will be done for the man who kills him. And so they just kind of recap and say, okay, you know, here's what's going to happen. Now, Before we go to verse 28, I want you to get this thought in your mind. The constant companion of destiny is doubt. Let me just say that again because I want it to register with you. You might want to write that down on your note page. That's one of the few sentences that I think are significant that I didn't write on that note page for you. The constant companion of destiny 
is doubt. Now, you ask any businessman in this room whether this is true or not. You ask people who have been called by God to do something or, uh, you know, I look at Marty and Don and, and they've been in Kosovo missionary work and I'll guarantee you that all through these years, a constant companion in their life has been doubt. Because when God calls you to something, uh, you don't know... How, where, when that's going to be, how that's going to be, how to do it. And, and, and as you begin to move toward those things, and I, I mean, I'm looking at some of our businessmen, and I know, I know some of the stuff that you guys have done and what you've had to do, and, and you've bought equipment, and you've prepared buildings, and you've set jobs in motion, and you've hired people, and you've done, I mean, you, you, you've just spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and bunches of money and lots of time and energy and effort. And all the way along in the back of your mind is, is doubt. Is this going to be successful? Are we going to, we're going to make it? Can I do it? Uh, am I going to have enough money? Are my people going to be good? And, and, and there's just doubt everywhere. And so I want you to get this in your mind because I, the message today is about doubt, actually. It's about how the enemy plants doubt in us to keep us from accomplishing God's assignment. Because if God speaks to you, see, see, God spoke to David and gave David an assignment. And from the time God anointed David, the enemy began to attack David to stop David from accomplishing that which God had for him to do. Now, the same is true for us. As soon as God speaks to us and gives us an assignment and we begin to understand the assignment, whether it's a, a marriage or whether it's going to school or whether it's the career I have or whether it's you know, uh, building a business or becoming a pastor or whatever it might be, as soon as God speaks to us about that and God speaks to us about our assignments in life, and some of us are going to be pastors, and some of us are going to be doctors, and some of us are going to be uh, uh, workers, blue-collar workers. Some are going to be moms. Some are going to be dad. I mean, there are all kind of assignments that God gives us. Don't think that God only speaks to people that are going to be ministers. I mean, God has an assignment for all of us. And when God assigns us, the enemy attacks and begins to challenge us with, with all kinds of things that are that are going to that are, that that are that are intended to stop us from accomplishing our assignment. And David has a well, I almost said David has a great destiny. I, but I stopped myself because we all have great destinies. All of our destinies are great because God gave them to us. Now David was called to be a, a mighty warrior and the king of Israel. But you're called to be mom or dad or, or, or businessman or worker or provider or whatever God might have called you to be. And so God has, has called us. And when God calls us, the enemy begins to try to plant doubt in us so that that doubt will make us doubt ourselves so that we will stop moving forward and, and, and quit moving toward the assignment from God. Now, with all that in mind, here we go in verse 28. When Eliab... David's oldest brother heard him speaking with the men. He burned with anger at him and asked, Why did you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. That ought to make some of you feel better. Well, see, some of you come from dysfunctional families, right? A little sibling rivalry going on, right? Yeah, this ought to make you feel good because here is David, the king of Israel, one of the greatest men of God in the word, used greatly by God, and look at what's happening. That, would you call that a little sibling? I know how wicked you are, and I know how conceited you are. Why are you down here, and who'd you leave those few little old sheep daddy's giving you charge of? Belittling him, insulting you know. What's Eliab doing to David. He's accusing David. And an accusation is one of the tools that the enemy uses to put doubt in our minds so that we will not accomplish what God has for us. One of the names that the Bible uses for the devil is the accuser of the brethren. 
Do you know that name's only used one time? It's used in Revelation chapter 12. And it's the only place in the Bible that that term is used to describe the devil. And, and in Revelation, it says that the devil stands in the presence of God day and night accusing brothers and sisters in the presence of God. And this might surprise you, and, 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 and I know we know this, but just to reiterate it, God, when God challenges you, when God convicts you, when God wants to get your attention, God never shames you or belittles you. God speaks to you, and, and he might show you yourself, and then you might be ashamed of what you see when you see yourself, but you won't find God belittling you and shaming you and, and, and lowering you. But you know who will? The devil will. He'll do it every time. And, and, and that's how you know who's talking to you. When, when you're a little confused about, well, is this really the Lord speaking to me about changing my life? Or I mean, think about what he just said. I'm sure, I'm sure that as we were worshiping today, that some of you were confronted by the enemy that some said something to you like, well, who do you think you are? Why, uh, you up in church? I mean, does your hypocrisy know no bounds? You know what you did last week. You got your hands up in the air. Why you got your hands up in the air? Don't you know who you are? Don't you know? Don't you remember what you said yesterday? I mean, come on, man. You got, and, and, and he just shames you and, and belittles you. I mean, lots of us, we all have Eliabs in our life that accuse and accuse and accuse and accuse. And imagine this. David is being accused. I, I thought I had a scripture. <laughs> David is being accused. You remember it. David is being accused by someone that he has been sent to serve. Think about that. Imagine that. David was sent to the battlefield to serve his brothers, and the first person that encounters him is one of his brothers who begins to accuse him of having some kind of ulterior motive about being there and being conceited and having all of these wicked plans to, to be down. I know your wicked heart. Well, no, bro. Actually, I just came down here to bring you some snacks. <laughs> Have you ever been attacked by somebody that you were trying to serve? That is a terrible feeling, isn't it? You want to look at them and say, how ungrateful are you, really? <laughs> you know? Your moms know how it feels, right? 13-year-old daughters. You got any 13-year-olds? That seems to be about the time most girls go crazy. <laughs> and mom gets to be the enemy, right? Dad, that's when we earn our money is when they get to be 13, 14, 15. They'll turn around by the time they get about 18 or 19, usually. And then mom will be the best friend again. But for those five or six years right there in the middle, boy, it is like battle royal. I mean, moms, you know what I mean. They come out of the room dressed in something, and you say, you're not wearing that out of the house. And then there's a little bit of a battle about it, and then finally they turn around and stomp their foot, snort, roll their eyes, and mumble on the way back to the room. I hate you, I hate you, hey. What? Oh, I thought I heard somebody say, and then she dies. I thought... <laughs> But, but you know how, I mean, and, 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 so, and so here is Eliab, David's brother that he's been sent to serve, uh, challenging his, his motives, accusing him. Uh, to accuse somebody is to attack their character. So verse 29, now, what have I done, said David? Can I even speak? How many of you have a little brother? You have a little brother? I had a little brother. If you have a little brother, you know, boy, that sounds just like my little brother right there. Can I even talk? You know, when our children were growing up, and I, I, I hate to embarrass Justin and Amy all the time, about, but I did tell them, I told them when they got old enough to understand, when they got old enough to understand, I did tell them, I said, you know why God gives ch uh, children to preachers? No, Dad. Why would that? So he can have sermon illustrations. And bless their hearts, they've been them all their life. But anyway, but, but they're not any different from your kids. If you've had kids, boy, growing up, they, they just know how to get to each other, don't they? I mean, they are professionals. They're very talented. You might even say gifted. Um, 
at being able to get to each other and just aggravate and irritate each other in a heartbeat worse than anybody else in the world. And the way you get past that is you have to learn to be better at ignoring your brother or sister than they are at tormenting you. And that's around the only way to get past that. And notice, notice now, David doesn't challenge, any, he doesn't argue, he doesn't fuss, he doesn't try to start making all of his points about why Eliab is wrong in what he's saying. No, notice what he did. He, he just employed a very simple strategy to combat this accusation. And notice what he did, verse 30. He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter and the men answered him as before. When the devil comes accusing you, what you have to do is you have to learn the turn. Ever look at your neighbor and say, learn the turn. When the enemy starts attacking and accusing, because he's going to do this now, and if you let him... He's going to influence you on what you think about yourself, and he's going to put doubt in your mind about your abilities, your capabilities, or whatever it might be, and you're going to stop moving forward in life. And so you've got to learn a strategy to deal with the devil, and David shows us right here. When, when his brother began accusing him and attacking him, all David did is just, David just, when his brother said, you, you know, yeah, I know you're wicked heart, and you evil, and David just turned and said, now what did you say that that guy said about the person who... He just turned away and went and appealed to a higher power. I mean, really, I guess that's really all he did. He just, it's like he turned and went and talked to the supervisor. I mean, you know, <laughs> he took it to a different place, you know. And uh, turn your eyes upon Jesus. I think about it. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I mean, you turn away. Turn to a higher source. And David said... Uh, What's going to be done? Because really, you know, what, he, what David knew was that Eliab was going to have nothing to do with whether he was going to be given permission to fight the giant. So what Eliab thought about anything didn't really matter at all because, because Eliab wasn't going to have any, anything to say about what was going on. So what David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. Now, this is going to be interesting because you will remember now all right, remember, David plays music for Saul at night when he gets tore up by that evil spirit or depressed or manic, bipolar, whatever it is that's going on with Saul. Uh, David is the one that's called in to play the harp for him. So now, uh, somebody heard David asking the question, what did you say was going to be done for that guy? Man? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Somebody said, went to Saul and said, Saul, this has got a little bitty boy down there talking about all this stuff. And Saul said, well, okay, bring him up there. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. And I'm imagining that about the time he gets that sentence out of his mouth, Saul is probably looking at him and going, uh, 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 wait a minute, son. Aren't you that harp, dude? <laughs> you know? I mean, hey, look, I, I know you play the harp pretty good, but, 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 but this, is not a, this is not a harp playing contest. This is a fight, and uh, you're not going to be able to play Goliath to sleep out there. This is hand-to-hand -hand combat. So what's David doing here with Saul, though? David is just simply asking permission, right? He's saying, well, you, you're the king of Israel. Will you give me the permission to go out here and just beat the fire out of this guy? Would you, would you give me permission to take care of this problem out there on the battlefield, I'll go out there and I'll tear him up and you won't have to worry about him anymore. And will you give me permission to do so? And I want you to look at what Saul said to him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man and he's been a warrior from, from his youth. You're not able. I wonder what the devil's been telling you this week that you're not able to do. It, that's practically the first words out of his mouth in any phrase he ever uses with us, right? You're not able. You'll blow it. You don't have enough sense. 
Right. You'll choke. Oh, you're going to put your children in therapy for real. I'm telling you, you don't turn around. You're only a single mom. You're only a single dad. You can't do this. You're not able to do this. And all kinds of charges. What is, what, what, what is Saul doing here? Saul is employing the second weapon that the devil gives to create doubt in our life, and that is belittling. Now, accusation is to attack your character. That's one thing. But belittling attacks your ability. It questions your ability. You're not able to do this. Yeah, what's been, I mean, what's been making you feel small lately? What's the devil been using to talk to you about the fact that you can't get, get the job done? And, and, and listen, when, somebody, when, when you get belittled, it can be quite unsettling because I'm just going to remind you that much of what Saul was saying is correct. It's true. God is a big old dude, and David is a little old boy. Verse 34, but David said to Saul, I started to entitle this message, and you'll have to forgive me. How big is your butt? <laughs> but David. Butt always changes things, right? Yeah, this is a big butt right here. <laughs> you know, you're not able to do it. He's a giant. You're a little old boy. And it ain't gonna but David. So we're, 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 we're about to see something change here now because butt always changes things. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. Now that really builds confidence, doesn't it? I am totally ready to fight the giant because I have been defending my father's sheep. That's, 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 that's like saying, I'm really good at Fortnite. I could totally save the world. <laughs> or, I'm great at Madden football. I can totally play in the Super Bowl. <laughs> but <laughs> your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, I struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. And when it turned on me, I seized it by the hair and struck it and killed it. And I thought when I read that, when it turned on me, when it turned, it didn't just run, when it turned on me, you know, stuff will turn on you sometimes, right? I mean, you got it going good, man. You, you got them running away. You finally got your stuff and you think, man, I got this thing by the tail on a downhill pool and everything's fine. And then all of a sudden something will turn on you. And when it turns on you, it's worse than it was before. So here's the enemy turning on David, and he said, I killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. In other words, David is saying, Don't, it doesn't matter how big your giant is. It matters how big your God is. And David said, I came up against all kind of things that were way bigger than me, but my God is bigger than all of those things. And what really matters, David is saying to Saul is, how big is your God? If you have a big God on the inside of you, then your problems are going to become minuscule. It doesn't mean that they go away. It doesn't mean that they're not there. David had to fight the bear. He had to fight the lion. He's going to have to fight the Philistine. But he just didn't have to fight him alone. He had a great big God that was helping him. And notice what happened. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Wait a minute, Saul. Wait a minute. A few minutes ago, you were saying No. And now you're saying, uh, go in. Good luck, bro. Uh, <laughs> I mean, good night, man. Uh, this is, there's a lot of stuff riding on this thing. I mean, it's not just David and Goliath riding on this thing. It's the Philistines and the Israelites. If David loses this battle, Israel's going to have to serve. They're going to become slaves to the Philistines. And the Philistines also, if they lose, they're going to have to become slaves to the, to the Israelites. I like this. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic and he put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. So Saul's, Saul starts dressing David up. 
Um, I mean, it's like, okay, uh, to Saul, David's going to be like a, an imitation of him. So he's going to dress him up in all of his armor and all his tunic. And, all, and, and, and it's almost like Saul's creating like a little mini-me, you know. And, and he's got David. And he got David. Now, look what happens. David fastened on the sword over the tunic. This Saul's sword, fastened on the sword over the tunic. And he tried to walk around because he was not used to them. I, I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Um, you can't be an imitation. That... that David, Saul was dressing David up so David could imitate him, so he could be like him. You know, there's nothing so heavy as this weight of uh, expectations for someone else. I mean, if you've grown up with the expectations of someone else riding on you, to be like dad or to be successful like your older brother or to be beautiful like your sister or whatever kind of uh, expectations of someone else loaded on you. Uh, you know, you, you just, you got to walk out. You can't be an imitation. You can't live life imitating somebody else. And so David says, this stuff isn't going to work for me. So I got to use my own stuff. And so David took off all of that stuff. Then he took his staff in his hand. All right. Now, I'm going to make this point because I'm going to show you something in just a minute. How, how, many, how many staffs did David have? One. One staff, right? Okay, so David gets his staff, his shepherd's staff. And he puts it and he picks it up. And so he's got the staff in his hand, right? All right, so he's got a staff. He took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream. And I know that you've been told that five is the number of grace, right? In the Bible, when you see the number five, uh, it, it, you're, you're about to see the grace of God go into effect. Uh, five porches around Bethesda, lots of fives. It, you'll, you'll see it. So we're expecting now to see some grace because David picks up five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. So in one hand, David has a staff, right? In the other hand, David has a sling, and he now goes out to the battlefield and he begins to approach the enemy because he's fighting for God now. Keep that in mind. And he's approaching this enemy that's way bigger, way more skilled, and all of that kind of stuff. So I'm thinking that the approach, you know, he's approaching him now, and I'm thinking this approach is going to be really important to watch and to see how David approaches this gigantic enemy. Well, now, we've all said we have giants in our life, right? We have enemies in our life. We have accusers. We have belittlers. We have doubt. We have an enemy in our life. And, and so we're just like David. So if we're just like David, I mean, think about it. David is anointed. You're anointed. David grew his gifts. You have to grow your gifts. David had to develop an attitude of passion. You have to develop an attitude of passion. David is now approaching the enemy that he's going to fight for God. So wouldn't it, wouldn't it kind of come in mind that we might want to approach our enemy like David is approaching his enemy? Yeah, yeah. So this approach is really important. And, 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 and our typical thought about David, and I mentioned this when I started, that we've all heard about it, we've read about it, we've been told Bible stories, our Bible school teachers, our, everybody has told us about David and John. And, 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 and what comes through many times is the picture of David with this slingshot, like, a, like, like Opie Taylor in his back pocket, you know, and he's got this little slingshot, and, he, and you know, and he's going to put this rocket in this slingshot that's kind of like a glorified spitball, and he's going to... And he's going to pull that little sling and let it go. And God's going to somehow anoint that spitball while it's right in the middle of the air. And, that, and it's going to hit that giant in the head. Whack! And the giant's going to fall down. And it's going to be a total miracle. Whoo! Little baby David whips big giant Goliath. David was totally the underdog. And I'm just going to ask you, was David really the underdog? I mean, was this battle really, <laughs> was, was David really uh, less? Warfare in the day, in the battle, in, in the Valley of Elah, contained three types of soldiers. Uh, if you've watched Braveheart or anything like that, you've seen these soldiers. 
All right, the first type of soldier was the cavalry. The cavalry guys rode horses, pulled war wagons or carts or chariots. They were the cavalry. And then there was the infantry. And the infantry was Goliath. The infantry wore shields, helmets, had a big shield and had a sword and had spears and javelin. And the infantry fought close quarters, hand-to-hand, man-to-man type combat. And then there was the artillery. The artillery were the archers. Boy, that's so scary, isn't it? Have you watched Braveheart? Have you seen the movie? I know it's real old. Man, those archers, it's like 200 of them or something. I don't know, a bunch of And they let those arrows fly, and their enemy over there, and all of a sudden, arrows just start raining out of the sky. If they didn't have those shields to put over them, man, they'd just be stabbing them. I mean, just pin cushions, you know? Man, that's a frightening weapon, really. They were the artillery of the day. And also, slingers. Slingers were artillery. And I'm telling you something, this sling is an awesome weapon. This, this sling is a very sophisticated weapon for its day. You, it, it, it wasn't a little slingshot like this. It was, a, it was a strap of leather, about wide as your finger, and a pouch, and another strap of leather about that wide. And it could, and, and it could be as long as the person is tall enough to manage it. So it could be, you know, shorter or longer based on how big the person was. And you put, you put, a, you put a rock or a, or a piece of uh, uh, lead or something in that, a piece of metal, and you start swinging that thing around, and you could get as many as six to seven revolutions a second. And then you'd let go of one of those, pe- one of those straps, and that projectile flies out of there with the force of a, of a 45 uh, pistol. Depending on how big the rock was, the, when it hit something, the force of that thing was like getting hit with a 45 caliber bullet coming out of something. I'm telling you, the slingers were something. Those slingers were bad, were bad boys. And they were, the, they were the marksmen. They were the snipers. They were the long-range fighters. They were the uh, snipe them down, knock them down, uh, pick them up. So here's the battle. Here's the battle. Big old... Uh, big swordsman Goliath against little boy slinger David. The infantry against the artillery. Who's going to win? It, it, this is an interesting theory. Let me, let me give you the next verse. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. Now, you have to keep this in mind. Goliath knows that in order to fight his fight, he's got to get close to the one he's fighting. Because he's going to grab him. He's going to hit him with that sword. He's going, I mean, it's hand to hand, man to man. And I'm sure that Goliath had in his mind that the type of person that Israel would have coming down would be a person just like him. He was a champion of Gath, and certainly they would send the champion of Israel. And so I'm sure he had in his mind, this is going to be a fight because we're going to be man to man, hand to hand. And, he's, and he had that, and he's just lumbering down the side of the valley. And the Bible says he has a shield bearer in front of him. Now, this is the interesting theory. Uh, many theologians and many medical people and people that have studied this and studied some of the things that he'll say, and I'll show you in just a minute some of the things Elias says. But because of some of the things he says and because of the way he's described coming down this mountain with this person in front of him leading him, this little shield bearer leading him, that, that Goliath suffered from some type of medical condition that created giantism. Now, we still have this today. I mean, how many of you, WWF, WCW, Andre the Giant? Andre the Giant was a giant. And he was a giant because his pituitary gland secreted too much human growth hormone and caused his body never to quit growing. But it also starts destroying internal organs, and he died when he was about 42, 43 years old because uh, you know, his heart blew up and his lungs blew out and his kidneys went everywhere. And he was also uh, very nearsighted. He couldn't see. Well, like Andre the Giant, many theologians feel that Goliath had a real problem seeing. And his giantism 
caused him to, 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 to be vulnerable. In other words, what made him scary made him vulnerable. And he's being led down the mountain, and this little boy's leading him down the mountain, and he's taking him because Goliath can't see where he's going. And so he's leading him down the mountain, and he's getting closer and closer all the time. And, and, um, and as, he gets, as, as, as he gets closer down to the battle, um, uh, David begins to see what's happening, and David then begins to move toward the battle. And look at verse 42. He looked David over as David got close enough for him to see. Now, remember, he didn't see him when he started, but as David gets on down there, he looked David over and he saw that he was a little more than a boy. Glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. Now, I don't know how handsome David was, but all I can say is he must have been really handsome. Because every time... The Holy Spirit talks about him. He tells us how handsome he was. And, he, and, and so Goliath sees, sees this image. He said, wait a minute. He said, that's, that's a boy. But they're sending a boy down here to, 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 to fight with me. And, 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 and so here he is again, uh, underestimating David, belittling David. He's, he was... He was more, nothing more than a little boy. And he said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? Now, the reason I asked you a while ago, how many sticks did David have in his hand? You said one is because of this verse where now Goliath said sticks, like plural. In other words, Goliath can't see that David doesn't have two sticks in his hand. Goliath sees the stick, which is a staff he had, but in the other hand is not a stick. In the other hand is a sling. And I propose to you that if Goliath could have seen the fact that David had a sling in that hand, he would have turned around and went right back up that mountain again because he knew what that meant. But he thought he had two sticks, and he, and he said, What am I, a dog? Did you come out to fight me with these sticks? And the Philistine cursed David and his gods. What's Goliath doing now? He's using the third tool of doubt, provoking. Oh, yeah, the enemy uses all three. Accuses you, attacks your character, belittles you. You don't have the ability. You're not able and now he provokes you. And what provoking does is attempts to get you off track and get you distracted enough while he keeps moving at you so he can get you. Because all of this time, this argument and all this stuff, is just, Goliath is just moving closer and closer all the time. Slow walking, Slow walking right at him. Coming at him. And, he's gonna, and, he, and, and, now, and now he starts... He starts cursing God, and he starts provoking David, and he starts doing, uh, so, that, so that, that David won't be paying attention, and he can ease right up on him. Yeah, Lawrence, he can just get on him. You know how he's doing. You know what he's doing, right? Look at what he did. Come here. This is Goliath. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and to the wild animals. And he will, if he can get close enough to David to get his hands on him, because he'll tear David apart. You see, if David... If David fights on the enemy's terms, he has no chance of winning. <clears throat> even if he's doing it for the right reason. Yeah, even if he's doing it for the right reason. If he lets Goliath get close enough to him to get his hands on him, David is a goner for sure. I mean, you know, you can love God with all of your heart and still have a pitiful, miserable life. Uh, you can read your Bible every day and, and, and still have a, a messed up marriage. You can quote every verse on prosperity and tithing and giving and be as broke as Cooter Brown's mule. That's, a, that's broke right there. You can... You, you can fast and pray and believe in health and, and come to the altar and lay it before God and still suffer. Why? Well, it's your approach. It's because if David allows the enemy 
to control his approach, the enemy is going to kill him, even though David is anointed by God and doing it for the right reason. Now, follow me. I said this a minute ago. You and David, you and I and David, we're, all, we're a lot alike. I mean, we're anointed. We're, 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 we have ability from God. We have a great attitude of passion. And so the approach that David used is the approach that we need to use to fight the enemy of our soul who would try to fill us with doubt so that we would not be able to accomplish the assignment that God has for us. And the approach David used was, keep your distance. You're a slinger, not an infantryman. I mean, if David got too close, the sling was ineffective. So David had to keep his distance. And what am I saying to you? I'm saying, look, keep your distance from your enemy. Goliath is trying to entice and provoke David to fight on his terms, but, 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 but David has an approach, and if David will not compromise his approach, he will not get close enough to the enemy, and he will destroy the enemy because his sling is greater than Goliath's sword, as long as he doesn't get close enough to let Goliath hit him with that sword. And so... Here's what David is showing us today, and that is keep your distance. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day, I'll give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. That's why we fight battles, by the way. And that's why God goes with us to fight these battles, so that the whole world can know. That the whole world can know what? When you got big problems, you got a big God. When you have big evils in your life, you've got a big God to conquer all those things and that God is bigger than any problem I have in my life. That the world may know this. All those gathered here, wait a minute, did I hear that? All those gathered here will know it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves for the battle is the Lord and he will give you into, into our hands as the Philistine moves closer See, Goliath still trying to move on down. As he moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. David had a line out there that he saw as the, as the line that he could not pass and be effective with his weapon. He sees Goliath moving closer and closer and closer, and David said, I got to get to my line and fire my weapon. And, he, and David ran to the battle line that he had in his mind and he stopped and he went no closer than the battle line, which says we need to draw some battle lines and we need to not go past our own battle lines. We need to have some strategies. We need to say, that's, uh, that's as close as I'm going, and that's it, and I'm going to fire my weapon. I'm a slinger. I have an air weapon. I'm, I'm sending it through the air. Maximum effect. David said that line right there, and he, went, he ran to the line, and he wouldn't go past the line. And he said, I'm fighting you from here. And, and reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he so how many stones did he have? And how many did he take out? One, okay. Uh, one of the other four. <laughs> it's like, okay, David has some contingency planned, right? <laughs> you know, mm, mm. Well, I mean, you know, you got you to have a plan if... That first plan doesn't work. You've got to have another plan, right? I mean, what happens if what I think is going to happen doesn't happen is really what it boils down to. David said, i got four other rocks. But, but if you read in 2 Samuel 21, you'll find out that Goliath has four brothers, by the way. So he's got one rock for each of them, too. So <laughs> he's reaching into his bag, and he's taking out a stone, and he slung it, and he struck the Philistine on the forehead. Goliath never knew what hit him. Goliath never saw what hit him. He thought David was still coming down there with two sticks and all of a sudden something went into his head and he fell dead right there on the spot. The stone, the stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down onto the ground. 
So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. I'm saying a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. All right, let's transition this. All right. Here is what Colossians says about Jesus. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them. Just like David made a public spectacle of Goliath. Jesus made a public spectacle of powers and authorities triumphing over them by the cross. So how does this transition for us? Well, Jesus triumphed over powers and principalities and sin and shame and disgust and despair. And Jesus made a public spectacle out of them when he died on the cross. David triumphed over the giant with a sling and a stone. Jesus triumphed over death with a, with a, with a cross and his blood. And we're all amazed that a, a, a little boy could take a sling and a stone and kill a big giant. But Jesus took two sticks and put himself on the two sticks and carried the weight of the sin of the entire world on his back. And because he did that, he made it where we can fight our enemy in a different way than has ever been fought before. Second Corinthians, Paul says this in, verse, in, in chapter 10. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. What does that mean? When the devil says, come here, don't go. When the enemy starts trying to move in on you and get close to you and, and, and foil you and, and criticize you and doubt you and, and manhandle you and mutilate you, we don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against principalities and, and, and powers and spiritual wickedness in what kind of places? In high places. So we don't fight a war like an infantry man. We fight an air war, man. Our, our enemy is in the air. Our enemy is, a, is in high places, is in spiritual places, places that we can't see. And because Jesus took two sticks and took the sin weight of the whole world on him, we can now fight in a way that is productive for us, just like David was a slinger and his weapon was an air projectile. He was a projectile warrior. We are Holy Ghost projectile warriors for the kingdom of God. And we don't have to fight like the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. Why? Because paper beats rock, rock beats scissors, scissors beats paper, and sling beats sword. We don't fight with those kind of weapons. We fight with the weapons of God. So it doesn't matter how big your enemies are it just, and how big a sword they have, as long as you don't let them get close enough to hit you with it. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they are divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We're slingers. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm a slinger. <laughs> it's not the size of your weapon. It's the distance. It's the distance. Giant's going to call you this week. What you, what you going to do? Giant's going, giant's going to stand in front of you this week. How are you going to handle it? The enemy's going to attack you this week. Uh, Eliab's going to be accusing you. Saul's going to be belittling you. Goliath's going to be provoking you this week. How are you going to handle that? Well, we're air warriors. We're slingers. I started thinking when I, I got to about this point in the mess and I, I, uh, in my study and I got to thinking and I said, I started humming a little song. If you guys want to come on, come on, musicians, our praisers. I started humming a little song. And you'll know it. You'll know the song. It's one of them that we just did, and man, it's good. It's just it's one of those, I raise a hallelujah. And I started thinking about the words. It says, I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah um, louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My, my, my weapon is a melody. 
I raise a hallelujah and heaven comes to fight for me. What's, what, 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 what's that all about? It's that the weapon that we fight with is an air weapon and it's our words. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a praise. I raise a rejoice. I raise a, a glory to God, a halal to Yah, a great praise to God. And God responds to that. I raise a hallelujah and, and my melody becomes a weapon. I raise a hallelujah and heaven comes to fight for me. And I thought to myself, this song's nothing but about this song's nothing but about this message today. Every phrase in it is how you fight the battle. So let's stand our feet and our team's gonna lead us and we're gonna sing this and uh, and then we're gonna leave, all right? All right, praise the Lord. Holy, holy, holy.
<laughs> Ooh, praise the Lord. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm a slinger, man. I'm raising a hallelujah. Yeah, the weaponry of God. Aren't you glad that we don't fight giants and we don't fight enemies face to face, hand to hand, and smack down range that God fights for us. The, and God's given us a weapon that's tremendous and it's the words that we use, the praises that we sing, the, the offerings that we give with our voice and our mouth and our lives and our speech and our testimony. You remember in the book of Revelation, what the Bible says about how we overcame the enemy and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. God's given us a tre tremendous weapon. Uh, Stay back, stay the distance back. Allow the weaponry of God to be, you, you know, if you get a sling too close, you can't sling it, right? Yeah, you get bound up. So let's, let's go out of here, let's sing this. I'm gonna have a word of prayer and then we'll sing it and leave on it, all right? Father, thank you for loving us today. We bless you. We pray that you go with us now in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. We're gonna sing it now, here we go. Glories, glories. All right, thank you for hanging with us today. Uh, praise the Lord. Hope the Lord has had a word for you. And uh, he's a great God. How big is your God? <laughs> All right, you guys are dismissed. You're going to grace the Lord. We love y'all. Have a good week.